the scandal. The scandal. We read from John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, the story of the woman caught in adultery. And we're going to deal with the scandal of adultery and the scandal of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in this passage. The scandal, something that's deeply offensive, is what the Lord Jesus said at the end of this passage. Neither do I condemn you, go and from now on sin no more. That's scandalous. Now, you may be thinking, oh, I'd love it when Jesus says that to me. I'm sure you would. But look at what's going on here. A woman caught in adultery. Caught in adultery. She was caught in the act. <clears throat> doesn't say where she was caught. Could have been going in to her lover's house. Could have been caught in public. Could have been in a really sordid place. That even in our sexually liberal age, we still look down on. The back of a shed. An alleyway. And here's what's deeply offensive about it. Imagine if you're stood in the crowd and this woman, caught in adultery, was caught with your husband and you knew Jesus. A man who you respect, a man who you look up to, a man who you think is a teacher of righteousness and he says to a woman caught in adultery with your husband, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What if this woman, dear friend, was found with your wife in that situation? You stood here, this woman is caught with your wife, and this person, this wonderful person you look up to, again I'm stressing this, says, neither do I condemn you. The woman you've loved for years, cared for, looked after, she's looked into your eye and said you're the only one. And she certainly didn't tell you anything about this sort of thing. And you hear, imagine how hurt you'd feel, how lied to you'd feel, how crushed you'd feel. And then you hear, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. What if, and now this is the big one, what if this woman was caught with your son in law? Yeah, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> your son-in-law cheated on your daughter. Your beautiful little daughter whom you've loved, whom you've cherished. She's got tears rolling down. Imagine if she, if she was found in your daughter's bed with your son-in-law. You can hear your grandchildren crying at the feeling of the Father letting them down. The shame, the betrayal, the broken trust, the hurt, the hate, the hate. And then you hear them, this religious teacher say, I don't condemn you. Don't do it again. What? That's all you've got to say? Do you know how much this has hurt me? What he's done to my daughter and my grandchildren? And that's all you've got to say? And don't say you wouldn't. Of course you would. 
<laughs> so would I. Forgiveness is scandalous. Forgiveness is offensive. Forgiveness goes against everything that is in us. We want revenge. We say, don't we? Oh, we want justice. What do we really want? We want revenge. We just say justice because it sounds more noble. We can, oh, that's what Christians do, isn't it? I was really angry. Oh, it was righteous indignation, though. I wanted to smash his face right in. But it was righteous anger. Yeah. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> Those little lies that Christians tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about our sin. But you see why I start, you may not. We, when do you ever dwell on that part of this passage? Tim Keller did this with uh, the <clears throat> prodigal son, didn't he? The prodigal son, he wrote a whole book on it, The Prodigal God. It's his greatest book ever written. And it's the best presentation of the gospel many of us have ever read. We miss the point. We sentimentalize. We... We look at these passages and it's such a patronizing way. Oh, isn't it wonderful? He could, he could look at this terrible sin and forgive. Yeah, it is a terrible sin. And he did do that. But imagine if it was done to you. There are many other things we're going to say about this passage, but I started like that just to show how offensive this is to our fallen human nature. And that forgiveness isn't easy. It wasn't for the Lord Jesus. He had to die. He had to die. This sin put him on the cross. And he could say with such clarity, I forgive you, because he knew what was going to happen. And by the way, we are going to come to hypocrisy in a bit, but if you are judging the Pharisees and saying, well, there's forgiveness. But those Pharisees, they're hypocrites. Well, just remember, there's forgiveness for hypocrites too. And isn't that just as well, given what I've just said? All the lies we tell ourselves. Jesus is gracious and merciful. As we sung in Psalm 103, he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And all those sordid sins that we just talked about, his blood makes them all clean and washes them away. And as Simone said, they go to the bottom of the sea and a sign says, no fishing. They've gone forever. Your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. An all-knowing God forgets. So now that we've pointed that out, let's look. The stuff that I'm going to say now is more familiar things that are usually said about this passage. But yeah, Tim Keller, sorry, I, I got sidetracked. Tim Keller's point in The Prodigal God is we sentimentalize these passages. The prodigal son we sentimentalize it. Oh, you know, that he came back and the father loved him and lavished him. And we forget that the older son was really annoyed and hated what was going on. And it's for people like that that story is actually told to. Yes, we all want to hear, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. But do we want to hear other people who've crossed us hear that from the Lord Jesus? I suspect that doesn't come as easy to us, does it? And there's grace, grace, wonder-working grace for you and for me who wouldn't, because I wouldn't find it easy either. One of the Puritans said, you can, you can point at, a, it's easier to point at one sin, in, a thousand sin in others than one in yourself, you know? So to begin, God's holy law. God's holy law. For everything we've just said, we do have to stress that God hates adultery. It was one of the <coughs> big ten, one of the ten commandments, because of the seriousness of it. God created marriage at the beginning. 
a ceremony that he blessed for man and woman to come together with fellowship with him. And it was to be lifelong. Yes, there are exceptions, I believe, in the New Testament that allow for it, but adultery was considered so serious that under the law of Moses, it carried the death penalty. Now, I can't dwell on this too long because this is a big topic. But some of you may wonder, and some people certainly on the news will wonder, when a Christian MP, or soon-to-be MP, gives their views on marriage and the law, well, why do you keep, why do you believe adultery is not? Why do you believe adultery is a sin, but why don't you stone people? Because the Bible says we should stone adulterers. Well, yeah, it does, but it also doesn't. The law of Moses was a covenant given exclusively to the people of Israel in the land of Israel, and it had a beginning in Exodus 20, and it ended at the cross. And I'm going to say something here, and I'm going to qualify it, but listen to this. Christ himself said the Old Testament wasn't God's perfect revealed will for all humanity. We're doing that in the book of Hebrews. It was filled with shadows of the good things to come. There were things that God allowed in the Old Testament as a concession to human sin. It wasn't God's perfect will for all humanity. It contained it, what we call the moral law. But it wasn't meant to be a blueprint for how every nation was governed. And it's a mistake, because unfortunately... In the good old United States, even now some Christians are saying, yes, we should look at the Old Testament as an example of how the U.S. should be governed. No, 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 seriously. It would be unscriptural to do that. And it misses the point. But, under it, but now that I've said all that, it did say under the law of Moses for the Jewish nation that when someone was caught in the act of adultery, they were to be stoned. That's an expression of God's holy indignation against it. Indeed, some commentators have noted that, well, it's there, isn't it? Jesus wrote on the, uh, with his finger on the ground. Some commentators say that that's reminiscent of God writing the Ten Commandments. He wrote it with his own finger. Jesus isn't minimizing the seriousness of what's gone on. The way the law is being used is the problem here. It's being misused. They're not actually interested in the law itself because they only bring one of the people here. Both parties under the law of Moses, should have been subject to the death penalty. And they're only doing it to trap the Lord Jesus himself. And when you play chess with the Lord Jesus, there's only one move, checkmate, and he wins. Amen. Which brings us to the next point, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is what we call double standards, or one rule for you, one rule for me. It's a kind of heads I win, tails you lose type of situation. Or, you know, count the hits, ignore the misses. The people, again, were using the law to trap the Lord Jesus and to bring down this poor lady who had done something terrible, who had done wrong, but was being a subject, basically a terrible victim in a theological uh, boxing match, if you will. They're trying to get Jesus tripped up so they can accuse him and crucify him. That's all they're bothered about. And this poor woman has been caught up in it. And imagine that. You know, making out you care about the act of adultery and you drag this poor woman through a crowd and say, we should stone her. What do you say? You know, imagine the terror. Imagine... We all know what it's like to have, well, I know quite often what it's like to have people watching us. But in, but here, I knew people were going to be watching me. 
I do this quite a lot. But when it's unplanned, when it's something that you know you're exposing your personal side of you, the 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 real you in one sense, it's horrible. And then to know that all you're there for is just so the religious authorities can try try and trap a rabbi. And indeed, I don't know too many adulterers, but there's always a sense of shame that comes with it. They know they're doing wrong. And that's what is happening here. The law is being used in a way that's not right. It's being used against a woman. And it's being used to trip up our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at his response. Jesus doesn't rush in to anything. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs over and over again, think before you speak, or words to that effect. You know, don't be rash with your words. You know, um, we will be seeing, if you're a political anorak, lots of heated discussions. People will say things they don't mean. People will say things they have no intention and that they know they have no intention of doing. We call them election debates. <laughs> But they'll say things in the heat of the moment that they'll have to be sorry for. They might leave their microphone on. We've seen that before. But Jesus doesn't do any of that. He considers calmly what's going on. What do you say? (coughs) Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. That probably would have wound them up even more, I'd imagine. (coughs) And they continued to ask him. He stood up and said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus challenges their hypocrisy, their misuse of Scripture, their double standards. Because to misuse God's word is a serious sin. Serious sin. At least adulterers are honest about it. At least adulterers are honest and say, yeah, we're doing something terrible. That's why they keep it a secret. To knowingly misuse scripture and to quote it to batter people, that's horrible. To use God's word like that? Mm-hmm. Terrible. Nobody, and as well, you know, again, as I say, adultery, you keep it, they keep it quiet. They would be ashamed if it was exposed. But this sort of hypocrisy, they don't even realize they're doing it, do they, for most of the time? And he says, you can cast the, a stone if you're without sin. I I always remember that film, The Greatest Story Ever Told. In that film, he 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 holds it out, doesn't he? He says, go on, take it off me. And then he writes down again. He bends down and writes. When they heard it, They went away one by one. We see something there of a conscience. They're not repenting. Being ashamed and walking away isn't repentance. Feeling shame is part of repentance, but if it's not followed by confession of sin, sorrow for sin, turning away from it and doing what's right, it's not repentance. Well, that'd be a lesson to all of us. Being ashamed isn't the whole story. 
but we see they are somewhat ashamed. They go <coughs> away, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So they've gone. They've been exposed, just like the woman has. And they don't face the Lord Jesus Christ the way she does. What does he say? Woman, where are they? And woman in the Bible times was a term of respect. You know, unfortunately, it's... We only ever... People only ever say woman when they're insulting. You know, oh, shut up, woman. Oh, stupid woman. And all that. Woman in the biblical times was a term of honour. Like the way we would say, or well, the Brits would say, my lady. You know... Where are they? Has no one condemned you? Indeed, no one could. Not under the parameters that the Lord Jesus has just set up. She was guilty of adultery. She never pleads innocence. She was caught in the act. But they couldn't condemn her because their own hearts were ripped apart with shame. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And we see the, the two-edged type of compassion of the Lord Jesus. There's forgiveness. I don't condemn you. You've done a terrible thing. He doesn't excuse what's gone on. She already knows she's done wrong, as I said. said that several times. But he says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Don't do it anymore. And as I say, that's wonderful to hear. But it shows the grace, the kindness, the mercy of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it does show how <laughs> scandalous God's grace is. D.A. Carson wrote a book called Scandalous. You know, or outra there was another book called, I can't remember who wrote it, Outrageous Grace. You know, we, we've got so, especially those of us who are Christians, we've got so used to hearing the Christian message, we forget. And as well, we've got 2,000 years of history. We forget how revolutionary, how countercultural it is. We're only finding out now that how countercultural it is, given that Britain's abandoned the Christian culture now. Yeah. How contrary it is. But he says, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. He shows compassion, he shows mercy. And he gives the command to do what's right. <clears throat> Outrageous grace, scandalous grace. Grace, scandalous because it goes against our instincts, doesn't it? If you're a hypocrite, if you're an adulterer, if you're a deeply religious person who's misused scripture, Jesus says to you today, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And remember what he said about adultery, and it applies to all sins. If you think of, if you lust after somebody, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's the seventh commandment. Now imagine all the others, you know, judgmentalism, self-righteousness, hypocrisy. They're sins of the heart. So if you spiritualize, you shall not commit adultery to that level. Imagine spiritualizing, don't be a hypocrite to that level. That's the holiness of God's law. And it's the height, depth, length, width of God's love for us in Christ. That having broken it, having turned away, having misused it, having abused it, having, well, I can sin this once, God will forgive me. There's mercy, grace, and peace 
in abundance towards those who are in Christ. So wherever you are today, know that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Does he? It's present tense. It goes on and on and on and on. And as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And that God became one of us, became dust and ashes, and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen.